My name is Chad Lewis. I'll be your presenter this evening. And even though my background is in the field of psychology, for the last 20 plus years, I've been traveling the world in search of the strange and unusual. Everything from hunting for vampires over in Transylvania, looking for the Loch Ness Monster, crop circles, UFOs, alien abductions, weird people, weird places, you name it, it's just strange, bizarre, and unusual. I've traveled around the world in search of it. They also have a Paradise, Michigan. You can pick which one you want to go to. But tonight we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is ghosts and haunted locations. Now, just by a show of your hands, how many of you have seen a program on TV about ghosts and hauntings? Yeah, nearly all of you. And it is fun to hear about these places when they're in New York or Texas, but it's a much different matter when these places are right in your own backyard. So that's what we're going to explore tonight. Some of Wisconsin's most haunted places. For the next 45 minutes, we'll take a tour of the entire state, ending up right back here in town. Now, I'm going to give you the background of these cases, the folklore, the eyewitness accounts. I'll even talk about some of the equipment that we use on our investigations at these places. Heck, I'll even provide you with their directions to these places. But I'm going to leave it up to each and every one of you to travel to these places on your own and determine for yourself whether or not you believe they're haunted. But I should warn you, it's much easier watching these places on television than it is visiting. When you're out in the middle of nowhere and you see that shadowy creature lurking from tree to tree, you simply can't turn to another channel and forget all about it. So with that in mind, let's explore some of the scariest places in Wisconsin. And when I talk about some of the scariest places here in our state, I'm not referring to the Packer Bears game. <laughs> this might be the scariest thing you'll see tonight. I'm talking places that people think are haunted with ghosts, spirits, and apparitions. Now, for a lot of people, when they think of a haunted place, they think of a cemetery. Reason being is quite simple. Back when cemeteries were chosen, the land was thought to serve as a portal between our world and the spirit world. So when your loved one passed on, it would just be easier for them to travel from our world to whatever world you believe they go to. But regardless of whether or not you believe this theory, the people in Appleton at Riverside Cemetery, they think it's working in reverse. That the living are not moving to the dead, but the dead are coming into our world. All the stories revolve around the gravestone of this young woman. Her name was Kate Blood. And when she was alive, it was said that she murdered her husband and their three young children. Therefore, she would not be allowed burial inside the cemetery proper. And it's true, she's down by the river all by herself, very secluded. If you are not looking for her, you probably wouldn't find her. But that's not the scary part. The scary part comes in the fact that many people who visit her gravestone often report seeing what appears to be some sort of hooded, cloaked, black, dark figure standing behind the gravestone. When they try to get a closer look to make out who or what this thing might be, it simply vanishes right before their eyes. But my favorite part of the story is the dare. A lot of these haunted places have dares attached to them. You have to do something in order for the dare to come true. And the dare hears that if you go to the cemetery at night, of course, and if you walk up to the gravestone, you will see what appears to be blood oozing out of the gravestone. I say it appears to be oozing out because witnesses I've spoken with told me that when they went to touch it, it was dry to the touch, even though they swore it was blood coming out of this gravestone. So I spent months and months and months researching this case to find out that Kate Blood did not murder her husband. Well, actually, I just read the tombstone. You can see here that her husband lived much longer than she did. And the thought to be the graves of the dead children are the graves of Kate, her husband, and her husband's second wife. When I dug up her obituary, it listed her as a great loving mother who would be missed in the community. So even though the story's not quite right, 
The legend still continues. In fact, many people who walk along the old trail that leads to the stations of the cross along the river report seeing disembodied balls of light floating around. They'll see out of the corner of their eyes somebody walking by. They'll hear weird noises. So even though the legend is a little uh, off, the stories still continue. But my favorite cemetery in all of Wisconsin is in Green Lake. It's a place called Dartford Cemetery. A lot of people have heard of this place because a few years ago, we did a program on the Discovery Channel called A Haunting that featured this cemetery. For decades, people talked about this cemetery being haunted. Oftentimes, people would be walking by the cemetery late at night when all of a sudden they would see what appeared to be the ghostly images of young children walking throughout the cemetery. Oftentimes, they'll see them in periods of the year when they're not properly dressed. Wondering why kids are out in the cemetery at such a late hour, witnesses will try to go closer only to have these phantom children disappear. In fact, when I first went there, I had some psychics with me who claimed that as soon as they walked in, they were being uh, pinched and pulled at on their leg by a playful spirit of a child. We had collected so many stories of these children <laughs> laughing and giggling, phantom noises, that when we went there, we brought a ton of recording equipment with us, hoping that on the days and nights we were there, we would capture these phantom sounds of the kids playing. Unfortunately, the entire time we were, were there, not a peep, but we did discover other legends at Dartford. In fact, many people paying their respects to their loved ones will often see what appears to be the ghost of a Native American man dressed in full native regalia, walking through the cemetery. It's a small cemetery in a rural area, so he obviously sticks out. People will follow him and watch him, only to report that he always disappears right over this gravestone. It's the grave of a former chief who drowned, was buried on his land, and then for some reason he was dug up, brought to Dartford, and reburied. Many believe it's his spirit wandering around as well. And I talk about this case quite a bit. People like to go there for their own experiences. Oftentimes they send me photos of their experiences, including this group that went there, wanted to take a photograph of the cemetery, and had a weird mist or fog appear on their camera that they did not see with the naked eye. But the dare gets even better here at Dartford Cemetery. The dare is that you need to find the haunted mausoleum. Don't worry, it's the only mausoleum in the cemetery. The dare is that if you're brave enough or foolish enough to stand or sit on top of this mausoleum, you'll be shoved to the ground by the angry spirits of those who are buried alive inside that mausoleum. A few years back, I spoke with a group of young teenagers. One was a football player who told me that he was up on the mausoleum one night, his buddies were down here, when all of a sudden someone, or something, shoved him from behind so hard, he barely had time to extend his arms to break his fall. The mausoleum sits about six and a half feet in height, so whatever pushed him had to have a lot of strength behind it. But I know what you're thinking, this is nothing more than teenagers with their imagination. A few years back, I spoke in Green Lake. After the program, a woman came up to me and said, Chad, I sat out on that mausoleum last night. I wasn't pushed to the ground. In fact, she said, I don't even think it's haunted. I was relieved because this woman was out in her 70s, out there looking to get shoved to the ground by angry spirits. The legend is that they were angry because they were buried alive. We found no indication whether this is true or not. So it begs the question, was anyone ever buried alive? Is it anything more than an urban legend? Well, yes, we know thousands of people were buried alive. We know this because we have thousands of newspaper accounts from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Now, back then, whether you were in a diabetic shock or in a coma, doctors would often pronounce you dead. But lo and behold, Many people, some of which were even at their own funeral, would pop up just in the nick of time to be saved from being buried alive. 
The idea of being buried alive may seem a little silly to us today with modern science and medicine, but our great-grandparents were so afraid of being buried alive, they came up with several inventions. My favorite is this. It's called a cemetery bell, and it does or did exactly what it looks like it would do. It was a bell that would sit on top of your grave with a rope on a pole going down into your casket. So if you awoke in time and found yourself buried alive, you could just tug that rope, it would ring the bell, and alert the caretaker who lived there that you were buried alive and they could come and rescue you. But there was one problem with this invention, though. On many nights, the wind would set these bells off, giving the caretaker quite a scare, thinking everyone had been buried alive. There's a lot of argument over the origin of the saying, saved by the bell. Many contend it's a boxing expression. Others say it dates back even further, where many believe it was literally being saved by this bell. Because for several nights after you died, your family would sit around your grave making sure you were truly dead. They'd be working the graveyard shift, and if they heard you ring the bell, you became a dead ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Believe it or not, one of the most commonly asked questions I get is, where can I go to spend the night in a haunted place? Well, if you have that macabre sense of adventure, you're in luck. In Wisconsin, we have hotels, motels, campgrounds, B&Bs that all have a haunted story to them. One of my favorite places to go is over in Milwaukee, a place called the Ambassador Hotel. Today, this place is a very fine, upscale, classy place to spend the night. But back in the 80s, it was a cesspool. They rented rooms out to drug dealers, prostitutes, pimps, criminals. They even rented rooms out to serial killers. Dahmer himself stayed there on many occasions. And on one night back in 1987, Dahmer was out partying at a bar, he picked up this gentleman, brought him back to his room at the Ambassador. There they fell asleep drinking, Dahmer woke up the next morning, this man was dead. Dahmer said he had no recollection as to what happened. But instead of going to the police and explaining the accident, Dahmer did what most of us would do. He went out and bought the biggest trunk he could find, came back, chopped that man up and put him in the trunk, brought the trunk to his grandmother's house where he lost track of where it went. We don't know. It might be in your attic or your basement right now. Dahmer didn't know where it went. But since that time, many people have had unexplained things happen at the Ambassador Hotel. Oftentimes, someone will call down to the front desk complaining that it sounds like two men are fighting to the death next to them. Oftentimes, the staff have to tell them they have no one next to them, at least not anyone who's alive. Others will see the ghostly image of a man covered in blood walking through the hallways, and he'll disappear right into the walls. It's thought to be one of Dahmer's victims. We don't know how many people he actually killed in this hotel. Others have seen Dahmer's spirit walking through the main lobby before disappearing right before their eyes. When I went there, they didn't have much to say about Dahmer's history, not because they didn't want to talk about it, which they didn't, but because they really didn't have the information. It was under brand new management, and you can imagine when you're renting rooms out to drug dealers and serial killers, record keeping's not the best of your abilities. So we don't actually know what room Dahmer stayed in. And even if we did, the place has been renovated so many times that it's probably a different room today. So my advice to you is every time you stay there, pick a new room, thereby increasing your chances of staying where Dahmer stayed so many years to go. ago. Just down the road from here is a great place with a great dare. It's outside of Evansville. It's called Weary Road. Legend is that old man Weary murdered a bunch of his children or some variation of that story. The townsfolk may or may not burn down his house, um, and he died, and now he haunts this old stretch of road where his farmstead used to be. 
Many people driving down this small stretch of road will be overcome with the sense that they shouldn't be there, almost as though it's a zone of fear. And judging by the amount of graffiti you see here, it's heavily visited by younger teenagers. So the story is that if you go out here, old man weary will chase you. People have seen weird things, uh, little creatures in the trees and the like. It is said that old man weary will chase you coming up from under the small bridge. The dare is that if you park your car on the bridge and turn it off, when you go to turn it back on, you will not be able to start it up and old man weary will come running after you until you can get out of that area. Everyone who's ever seen Old Man Weary has told me he's approached from behind chasing them. Very rare is it that Old Man Weary will come up from the front. I just recently spoke to a woman who was out at Weary Road many years ago with her friends, and as soon as they got out on the road, they felt like they shouldn't be there. And a huge fog started to roll in over the road. And as they sat there by the bridge debating whether they should get the heck out of there, they noticed right off on the side of the road this giant creature. She said it was the size of a bear, but shaped more like a wolf. It had glowing yellow eyes. She immediately tore off out of the area because she had the sense that even though she was in her vehicle, that if she would have stayed there, this creature would have killed her. It's very common for people that encounter these creatures to have an unnatural sense of fear that their life is in danger even if they're in their vehicle driving away from these creatures. But I'll leave it up to you to go to Weary Road and see if this creature will attack you. Probably not. Maybe not. 50-50? Let me know. Anyone here from Stevens Point? No? Good. Then you won't have to worry about avoiding this place. It's called Highway 66. Except the people in Stevens Point, they don't call it that. They call it Bloody Bride Bridge. Legend is, many years ago, a young woman was coming home on her wedding night. She was involved in a car accident on this bridge, and she bled to death, waiting for help to arrive. And since that moment, many unsuspecting motorists driving down the road will often catch sight of what appears to be a woman dressed in a bloody bridal gown on the side of the road. They'll often think maybe she broke down or needs some assistance, so they slow down only to have her disappear right before their eyes. One of the first witnesses was said to be a police officer driving over the bridge late at night when this woman popped out of nowhere. He slammed on his brakes, closed his eyes, and braced for impact. Once he came to a screeching halt, he got out to see the damage, only to find that nobody was there. He scoured the area, convinced that he had actually hit somebody, flesh and blood, but nobody was there. But the dare gets even better. The dare states that if you park your car on this bridge, when you look into your back mirror, not only will you see the ghost of that bloody bride, but many witnesses have told me that the bride was actually sitting right in their back seat when they looked in their mirror. Luckily or unluckily for me, the dozen or so times I've waited for her, she has not appeared for me. But if you do take this dare, make sure the road is completely dead of cars because it's a busy bridge. I would hate for you to end up in my next program because you were in an accident on that bridge. But she's not the only hitchhiking woman on the side of the road. In fact, one of the first cases I ever investigated, 20 plus years ago, right outside of my hometown of Eau Claire, is a small little place called Elk Lake Dam. It's right outside of Eau Claire, beautiful little place. And one night, don't worry, there's nothing to see here, two men were sitting right here, enjoying the beautiful waterfall. It's a gorgeous rural area. When right here, one of them looked around, turned back, and saw what appeared to be a glowing woman in white standing behind him. He nudged his buddy and said, hey, do you know there's a glowing woman behind us? His buddy said, yep, but I'm too afraid to turn around and look. 
About a half hour went by, they finally got the collective courage to turn around and look. The woman was gone, so were the two men. They hightailed it out of there as fast as they could. One of them was so frightened, he refused to bring us back to this location. But the other one agreed to bring me back. At the time, I was a UW Stout student, and one of my cohorts in the psychology program was a young man named Aaron. He believed he was psychic. He could pick up on these spirits. So I brought him along, and while we were there, Aaron and I wanted to take a photograph of one another, right where the two men would have been sitting that evening. But you can see here his camera would not work. Worked later, it worked before, but it would not snap a photo. I snapped a photo, and when the film came back, back when people actually used film, we noticed this weird mist or fog that wasn't visible to the naked eye, at least not when I snapped the photo. So I started talking about this case, and after a program, a gentleman came up to me and told me that he lived out in this area in the 1970s. He recalled there was a murder out there, but that's all he could remember. So I started flipping through my local newspaper in the year 1970 through 1970, day by day, looking for a murder. Unfortunately, by the time I reached 1974, I realized the man was right. There was a murder of a person out there, but not just any nameless, faceless person. This person, her name was Mary. She was hitchhiking from Minneapolis to Chicago last seen being picked up on the side of the road by this gentleman who was last seen kicking leaves and snow and dirt over something on the side of the road. The rural neighborhood thought it was suspicious. They called the police. By the time the police got there, the man was gone. The body of Mary was on the ground. She had been stabbed to death. And even though they had a witness description of the man, he was never captured and the case went unsolved. Well, now I decided to go back. If this place was haunted, maybe it was haunted by this young Mary. I brought Aaron the psychic with me. He wanted me to take a photograph of this pillar, which I did. I took dozens that night. This was the only one out of the ordinary that came back with something on it. It was also here we heard the strange sound of what appeared to be a woman screaming. But it didn't quite sound human, but it wasn't machine-like either. And of course, it didn't record on any of our audio recorders. But as we were leaving, Aaron believed that the spirit of this woman was going to try to follow us back to the university. So he snapped one last photograph, and I'll let you decide whether or not she was trying to follow us back. Because when the film came back, this is what appeared on the film. Many people have seen shapes and shadows and the light on this film. But the good news is, is that so many people have gone here to see the ghost of Mary. So many media outlets have covered this story that the Dunn County Sheriff's Department reopened the case into the murder of young Mary. They even dug up her grave looking for DNA evidence, which they did not find. But keep in mind, this was only 44 years ago. The killer was never apprehended. I often wonder if he's ever come to one of my lectures and seen his grisly deeds on the screen. So you may want to see who you're seated next to tonight, and maybe we could solve this case and give this young woman some rest. I love cases like this because not only do you get a haunted story here, you get a bonus as well. And you'll see what I mean. This is a place called Mary Dean. It is an island out near Menominee, Wisconsin. An entire town lived out on an island. It's named after a young girl by the name of Mary Dean, who it was said she drowned while coming up on an old steamship, and they buried her on the island on an unmarked grave. At one point, an entire town lived out on this island. They had a post office and stores. The only way to get there was by ferry. But many people believe that it's still haunted by Mary Dean. Many people go there to take the dare. So what is the dare of Mary Dean? Well, let's take a look. I'm here at the boat landing of Mary Dean where the dare is that if you're foolish enough to go into the water, the vengeful spirit of Mary Dean will try to pull you under and you'll meet your watery grave and spend eternity in the river with Mary Dean. So I'm going to take this dare right now. 
No life jacket, no swimming apparel, just me versus Mary Dean. So let's see how this goes. I know you're all wondering if I survive or not, but... <laughs> so I'll walk out, it'll get deep and then shallow and then deep as I make my way to the middle. I love this because you can camp uh, out on the island. You don't need to register, you don't need to pay, you can just go out there and throw your camp gear there. I also did this there at night, but it didn't look quite as well, uh, great, so I did it in the day. If you didn't catch it, many people claim that they hear her say things like, help me, I'm drowning, save me, come out and rescue me. And then those who do are said to get sucked into the current and drown. There have been numerous mysterious drownings out on this river. Every year, several people claim that they were simply drawn to the river for some unknown reason. I'm out here in the middle of the river, waiting for Mary Dean to pull me under. So I sit out there for quite some time. She doesn't pull me under. I make my way back. Well, thankfully, the spirit of Mary Dean did not pull me under into those dark, churning, cold waters of the river. So another deer completed. With the weather we've been having this year, you could probably get there this weekend and try the dare when the water's still warm. In fact, if you want to see more dares, go to my website. I've done dozens of dares around the world. You don't have to risk your life doing them. You can watch some crazy person risk their life. But the story gets even better here, if you can believe that. Because it was said that when the island was inhabited, one of the men had some dogs, and those dogs mauled some children and had to be put to death. And now the legend is that when you go there to see the ghost of Mary Dean, you might encounter what many witnesses are calling the hellhounds of Mary Dean. These large black dogs with glowing red or green eyes. They've been reported throughout culture in nearly every country in the world. Many people believe that these are a do the devil's bidding, that they are a harbinger of death, meaning that if you see a hellhound, much like seeing or hearing the Irish banshee, it means you or someone you know is going to die very shortly. But just to show you we're not the only weird people to believe in hellhounds, a few years back I was over in the country of Belize uh, going through their forests and their jungles there, here I am looking for a diminutive creature that they call the Tata Duende, a creature, a protector of their jungle. And everywhere we went, villagers said, you better get back to town before nightfall, because if you don't get back to the village before the sun goes down, you might encounter one of our hellhounds. They called them Cadeos. And they believed that these creatures had supernatural powers, that they could take your sight, your hearing, or your life. And that if they connected with you, unless you could find a powerful shaman or a bush doctor, you'd be dead within a week of seeing these creatures. So being the researchers that we were, we made it a point to stay out past dark every night. And luckily I'm still here today. But back to the boat landing of Mary Dean. After a program I did one day, a gentleman came up to me. He was a big, burly biker guy. You know the type of guy you wouldn't think would get spooked by anything. He told me him and his buddies took their motorcycles out here to see the ghost of Mary Dean. They had no idea about the hellhound stories. But as soon as they got there, he said they were surrounded by hellhounds. When I asked him why he thought they were hellhounds and not just wild dogs, he said three things stood out. One, they had glowing red eyes. Two, they were nearly transparent. He could almost see right through them. And three, no matter how fast they went on their motorcycles to get away, these creatures kept up with them. It wasn't until he went to kick one and his big biker boot went through it that they finally disappeared. He told me they did not quit driving until they hit the safety of Chippewa Falls, which is about 20 miles away. I didn't ask if they toured the Liney's Brewery after that, but they probably should have. But these are seem to be portals where not only hauntings, but creatures seem to lurk. Another example of that is the aptly named Devil's Punch Bowl, right outside of UW Stout in Wisconsin. For years, people have seen mysterious balls of light similar to these floating through the area, changing in size, shape, and color. 
I spoke with a group of young men who were sitting here, teenagers one night, debating whether they should go down into the punch bowl when all of a sudden a ball of light came toward their car. They told me their ball of light actually entered inside their car. And I asked them, I said, well, what did you do when that ball of light came into your car? And these young guys all looked at me as though I was crazy. They said, we got out of the car. <laughs> Pretty common response. But if you do get out, go down to the punch bowl. People have seen apparitions down here. They've heard weird voices and chanting. It's thought to be a sacred area for the first native peoples of the area. But my favorite story here is a woman was out hiking with her young son. They were about to leave up the staircase right here when she took one last look back at the waterfall. And when she did, she noticed something was staring back at her. What she saw sitting on the waterfall was... Well, maybe I'd better let you just take a look. This creature! She reported it straight out of folklore. Three feet tall, pointed ears, pointed cap. You know, something out of leprechaun, gnome, goblin, the little people, the hidden people, the good folk, sprites, spirits, you name it. That's what she saw. She immediately grabbed her son and said, Hey, do you see this creature? And by the time the sun spun around, the creature either ran into the woods or through the tunnel. It wouldn't be long later when a UW Stout student, uh, he was a football player, took his girlfriend down to the punch bowl during Halloween time. He wanted to really scare her, to get her into the mood for Halloween. And they got about halfway down the stairs here when they both heard a growl from a creature they could not identify. And his plan worked. Except it wasn't the girlfriend who got scared. The football player ran back to the parking lot. I spoke with this young girl who told me she sat there for another 15 minutes hoping that the creature would make another sound or appear. But then she felt bad and had to go rescue her boyfriend. <laughs> now over in Ireland when I go into the pubs, they believed that these creatures had supernatural powers. That when you go looking for them, they advise that you bring an offering with you whether it's some candy, a shiny rock, some tobacco, something that will make it so the little people will not curse you when you go looking for them. Many cultures have the belief that when you go looking for the weird, the weird comes looking for you. Many cultures won't even utter the name of some creatures because that's enough to put you on their radar. In fact, when I was hunting for the Tata Duende, everyone I talked to said, why are you looking for this creature? Do not try to find it. We try to avoid it. But I want you to keep in mind that not all monsters in Wisconsin look like this. In fact, some monsters in Wisconsin are even scarier than this. Because some monsters in our state, yeah, very scary. Some monsters in our state, those monsters look a little bit more like this. Anyone recognize this gentleman? Very good. Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield, Wisconsin. If you forgot Ed's story, back in the 1950s, you might recall some of the movies they based on his life, including that of Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Silence of the Lambs, and many, many others. Now, most people just remember Ed as a murderer, and true he was. He killed two people that we know of, but probably half a dozen more, including his own brother. But before he was captured, Ed was well-liked in Plainfield. Odd, but well-liked. He would babysit for kids, and he'd bring his neighbors over what he called a venison stew for them to eat. I had one neighbor tell me that he remembered his mother getting this stew. It had such an awful smell to it that she threw it away. Good thing for her, because even though Ed was a murderer, his real passion was to wait until it got dark. Then, for over a decade, he would fire up his vehicle and head down to the nearby cemeteries where he would dig up the bodies of women that reminded him of his own deceased mother. He would then bring those remains back to his farmhouse. He lived in squalor, and he would turn them into lampshades and furniture and the like. There's some young folks here in the audience tonight so I'm going to skip some of the stuff that Gein did. If you'd rather not sleep tonight, you can Google Ed Gein. Don't do it. You'll be cursing my name all night. 
He had a human heart on the stove. He had a belt adorned with women's body parts. The first people that came in found skulls all over that he was using as candlestick holders. Again, we won't even get into his bedroom antics. But when Ed really got a bug in his system, what he would do is make an entire outfit of this material, and he would wear it like a demented Halloween costume as he danced under the moonlight in his front yard. But you see, when we finally caught Gein and discovered truly how evil he was, they wanted to open his house as a roadside attraction, a museum of horrors that you could pay to go and visit. But before they were able to do so, it mysteriously burned to the ground. Well, townsfolk torched it, allegedly. But even though the home's gone, many believe Gein has forever stained Plainfield with some type of evil curse because of his deeds. And they may be right. I don't know. Many people have experiences there, including at some of the cemeteries where Gein did his grave robbing, also where Gein's buried right next to some of the victims that he dug up. Many people will go out to these cemeteries and see what appears to be somebody digging a grave. But when they get a little closer thinking, why aren't they using a backhoe, the person simply vanishes right into thin air and there's no grave being dug. Others will see what appears to be Dean himself on his final resting place. Dean's tombstone is no longer there. It was stolen so many times they finally just said, we're not putting one back up. But his family's still buried there. You'll find his grave because people leave trinkets and pennies and the like, and they steal dirt from his grave as a grisly souvenir. Others, when they're done visiting the cemeteries, will go to the old warden's hardware store. This is where Gein actually took one of his living victims, Mrs. Warden, who owned the hardware store. Today it is a hardware hank, but inside hasn't changed much over the years. Former staff and workers told us they'd often be doing inventory or putting up new uh, equipment when all of a sudden a box would go flying across the room as though thrown by some unseen force. Others will walk in and hear the sound of a rifle being fired. They can smell the gun smoke, the gunpowder, they heard it, but no bullet has ever been fired. Gein actually killed Mrs. Warden with a rifle in the store. Others will be working when all of a sudden they'll see a woman come in the store, thinking she's a customer, they'll ask her if she needs help, and she vanishes right before their eyes. It's thought to be Mrs. Warden's spirit. But the most popular place, if you can call it that, in Plainfield is Gein's old farm. Of course, as you saw, the home is gone, but the land is still there. Many believe it's cursed. Many people who venture out here report hearing the screams of women thought to be Gein's victim. Others will see what appears to be Gein himself walking along his property. Many people have told me they feel like they've been cursed after visiting here. They'll get in a car accident, they'll run out of gas, um, all kinds of weird things happen. One woman struck a deer and ran out of gas in the same night. She thought the place was cursed. But if you do go here, don't do it on Halloween. Most likely you'll get a trespassing ticket instead of a ghost story. What's interesting is the first time I went here, I had two psychics with me. They had no idea where we were. They thought we were in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, which is where Plainsfield is. Plainfield is. And as soon as we pulled up to this field, they refused to get out of the car because they were picking up on too much negative energy. They didn't want to get out. And those are the cases I really love. The cases where the psychics are too afraid to get out and visit where Dean uh, made his home. But as I'm running low on time, I want to end with the type of case that you haven't heard me talk about this evening because it's a private home. And a lot of people who live in a house that is thought to be haunted, they don't want it to be known that their house is haunted. That's why this is not even an accurate drawing of the house I'm going to tell you about. It was back in 2002, 2003 when I was collecting stories traveling the state for the Wisconsin book when I ran across a story from the area here about a haunted house. Tales were that nobody would want to spend the night and stay in this house. People would buy it, move out right away. They tried renting it. 
No one would stay. Mysterious knocking and rappings on the doors. People seeing the vanishing view of somebody walking by them. People seeing what or hearing what appeared to be someone walking up and down the stairs at all times of the night, but nobody was ever there. Objects moving on their own, being rearranged. But here's the kicker. I'm not going to tell you where this house is here in the area, because later tonight, when all of you go home and put your head down on your pillows, I want you to ask yourself, how much do you know about the history of your house? And is it possible not only that you're living in a haunted house, but you might be living in the very same house that I'm talking about right now. So with that, I wanted to save the last 10 minutes or so that we have for any questions, comments, or stories that any of you might have. If you want more information, my website has more than you could ever possibly want or need. Was anyone around of a certain age that remembers the Gein stuff when it was happening? Yep. Usually a few people. I've had many people tell me that they remember as a kid hearing the Gein story and that's the first time their parents ever locked the front door when they captured Ed Gein. A woman last year in October stood up and recited Twas the Night Before Christmas all about Ed Gein. It was creepy. She had learned it as a kid and it stuck with her. And I'm glad I didn't record it because it was really scary. Yes, yeah, sir, you had a question or comment? Yeah. Did Ed Gein, uh, so he never married, he never had kids, is that right? That's right. Are there any descendants uh, that still live up uh, in or near Plainfield, do you know? None of the immediate Gein family. Uh, Gein didn't have any children, his brother didn't. His brother mysteriously died in a field uh, doing work, uh, inhaling um, smoke, and Ed found him, and most likely Ed killed him, but uh, none of the Gein uh, family had children, and they were really, really odd. Again, likable, it was one of those characters that you'd say, oh, he's just the town character, harmless. And Ed would often joke when people came over and said, what's in the jar, Ed? And he'd say, a human heart. And they oh, Eddie, you kid are you? Um, the reason he got caught is he went into that hardware store to buy some antifreeze. And the Mrs. Warden and her son, who was a deputy sheriff, uh, said, we're out, you'll have to come back tomorrow, Ed. And the next day was deer hunting, and the son went out deer hunting, and when he came back to the store, there was blood everywhere, the safe was kicked open, his mother was missing, and he's wondering what the heck, and looks over, and there's a sale for antifreeze. And the last sale was for antifreeze, and he remembered Dean was in there, and they rushed out, and unfortunately, they found his mother strung up in a barn, uh, dressed out like a deer. Yeah. Did he end up in a mental hospital for a long time? Yeah, believe it or not, the law, uh, the court found him too insane to stand trial. And they brought him to the insane asylum here in Wisconsin. And I talked to many nurses that worked there, some of which said that um, they'd often put dances on for the patients, the guests they called them. And for some reason, no one wanted to dance with Dean, so <laughs> nurses would often have to dance with him. And, and they said that... At first glance, you know, he was this unassuming grandfather-type figure, but when you looked at him, you could sense something wasn't right. And if you ever read Gein's interrogation, it's like they're talking to a five-year-old. He claims that he was in a trance most of it. He doesn't recall why he did it, how he did it, or even if he did it. But at first, at first, they didn't believe him when he said, I dug up dozens of people. So they started checking the graves that he said he dug up, and after about a dozen, they said, we believe you. And they didn't, they didn't disturb the rest. And um, they didn't know what body parts to put back, uh, what they could. So, yeah, a creepy, really creepy thing. Um, yes? Yeah, you had something else? The hardware store is closed now. Yeah, yeah, it was for sale for a while. Someone should buy it. And, it's, and then it's creepy in there. Yeah. And the, even though it was 57, 58, uh, people in Plainfield don't like talking about it to this very day. That uh, Because every month or so I'll get a call from a documentary producer or something wanting to do something on Dean. And the fascination with him just is endless, even all these years later. And, yeah. and then if you've been to Plainfield, there's not much there. So I always advise people when they did stop into the hardware store, you know, to buy a light bulb or an extension cord or something to get them to open up. But, um, they had to cancel the Dahmer tours. They were wanting to do Dahmer tours, 
bus tours in Milwaukee where it brought you to all the bars that he took his victims from and there was such an out uproar. Which is much different. In Villisca, Iowa, they have an axe murder house where a family of seven um, and two family friends were murdered um, back in 1912 and now you can rent it out for the evening and stay. It's called the Villisca Axe Murder House and it rents out for $400 a night and it's booked almost all year long. So those crazy islands, right? Have, yeah. have you ever checked out in Kiwani, the hotel? The Carson Inn, yes. Beautiful place. Okay. Uh, thought to be haunted by several people, including an old woman. And now, I've stayed there a few times. The only thing that was kind of out of the ordinary for me when I was staying there is we were staying and the staff gave us a tour of the basement and told us all kinds of things would happen. And that when we were, it was about 2 a.m., we were just laying down in a, the room, had all of our equipment running, just kind of uh, uh, talking about theories of why it would be haunted. Um, got really quiet, and then all of a sudden in our room, it sounded like someone put a boot in a dryer and turned it on. Boom, 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 boom. And that was it. And um, people have all kinds of experience at the car store. Yeah. Beautiful place. Even if you don't believe in ghosts or spirits, some of these haunted places have so much history that you'll leave with a, a wonderful weekend at the very least. Yes? What's your strangest personal experience? Strangest personal experience? Um, I was down in Central America and for me, I always say, if you're going to these places and you're not getting scared, you're not trying hard enough. These are creepy places and um, I probably for me, the top scariest place or one of them was Transylvania. I was uh, going through the woods at night in Transylvania. I was staying at a farm about a mile from town, two miles, and I had to cut through the woods to get some supplies. And it was dark out. And you know, being the experienced researcher that I was, all I had was a little light. That's it. Nothing. Forgot everything else. Anyway, so I'm walking through the woods, and the moon's out, and I'm thinking, this is wonderful. I'm in Transylvania. How cool is this? But then your mind starts playing tricks on you that every branch breaking was Vlad the Impaler coming up, inviting you to his castle. So I ended up running to town, and I ran back uh, as close as I could without them knowing I ran. And I wasn't afraid of a vampire because I had my vampire hunting kit with me. I was more afraid of the atmosphere, and that's what really gets me. The creepiness, the what if, and it's, it's just human nature to get spooked. If you don't believe in werewolves, you just walking down Bray Road where the beast of Bray Road is thought to lurk. And there's cornfields everywhere. You're at, by yourself at midnight. Your pace starts to quicken even if you're the most diehard skeptic in the world. Just, just human nature. So that, those are the things that get me. But in terms of paranormal events, there's always subtle things like capturing those weird mists on film or psychics claiming they've been pushed or pinched when they were at places. But... It's never anything that I would say 100% is paranormal.